Let me first thank uh, both ORF, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs, and the Carnegie India Foundation for having invited me to this uh, DPI conclave, which specifically focuses on how AI can play a role along with DPI. And fundamentally, you know, I think in the Indian context, everyone has spoken about what DPI really means for India and what the story has been. Uh, clearly, there has been a digital transformation which is visible to everybody. But most importantly, I think uh, the key message through the DPI mechanism is both democratization and inclusion. I think those are the two elemental principles of what needs to happen. And if somewhere it falls short or it proves to be exclusionary in some form or the other, then that's something which needs to be addressed. You know, I always have this, and the exclusion can happen for a number of reasons. It can be pure infrastructure in terms of a place not having the reach. It could be uh, lack of awareness. It could be lack of knowledge. It could be a range of issues or a, a lack of access to a device. And I think each of these kind of issues need to be resolved in order for DPIs to be really effective. And that's something that I think... India as a whole, by having a mobile first kind of experience is attempting to resolve and by having connectivity across the country in terms of having that backbone. So uh, both by using handheld devices and being focused on a mobile first environment, I think that helps. And clearly the other part which helps is reaching connectivity across. So those investments necessarily have to be made. And the other part of it really is that there are some of these investments, if you don't do it through a public means or through a public-private partnership means where you're not looking at just the infrastructure as a means to make the big profits, then you're clearly sort of looking at a mechanism where uh, uh, you can spread it out and you can reach it to places that really need them. Today, we are able to actually build mobile phones in the country and most of the mobile phones that we use now are made in the country itself. And you're able to reach practically everybody. There are a billion mobile phone, smartphone users in the country. We produce almost uh, close to 330 million every year. Fundamentally, we are replacing once every three years. And that's becoming the way that it, it communicates. And thanks to policies on the telecom side, you actually have a scenario where uh, data connections are cheap and you're able to sort of reach out, but that doesn't preclude us from making further investments in fixed broadband, which would be the next stage. This was, this was one of those mechanisms where we could actually jump and get that. Likewise, I think the, um, and I don't want to repeat much of what has been already said, but even then, Figuring out who is getting excluded and figuring out why they are getting excluded is important. Some of it is sheer ageism. An older generation gets excluded, and that is something which then means that you have to make it simple enough. You have to make it literally idiot-proof so that anybody can use it. I, I tend to call it my mom test, you know, in the sense if my mother can understand this at 82, then, you know, anybody else can figure it out. And that's the test we need to meet when you're creating applications and you're creating a whole host of uh, things that uh, that people can use. So an 18-year-old figuring out is no big deal, or even a 16-year-old figuring out is no big deal. They figure it out very easily. But it's to sort of make sure that, you know, you include everybody is important. And I think it's important to keep that touchstone in mind uh, at every stage that we do it. And I think that is the principle on which I think at least the government of India engages in the course of our different partnerships across different countries. That's the principle on which we engage, that, you know, inclusion and democratization and decentralization are the principles on which this is based and the way we need to do it. And as far as AI is concerned, there again, in terms of how it operates as a layer on top of the DPIs and how we sort of address the data issues becomes very important. I think two things which are significant and which I think need to be addressed, one is you know, AI will depend on a lot of data. DPIs will tend to collect a lot of data. And they will have repositories where some of this data will be there, even if in the transaction layer, uh, you are able to um, avoid data moving around. So when this happens, how do you ensure that 
the concerns of data privacy and security are taken care of. I think first is data privacy. Uh, we now have a Digital Personal Data Protection Act and the rules which have been brought out, which in many ways, I think, addresses this balance. It addresses this question of how do you make sure that the, the data is kept private to the maximum extent possible, but at the same time is available for users in ways that can actually benefit uh, um, uh, the larger community. So to that extent, the recognition of the principle that, you know, the data belongs to the data principle or the person to whom it relates, and it can be used only with consent, with valid consent, is a very important building block in this. And how do we enable this valid consent to be uh, um, obtained as easily and seamlessly at, as possible, but at the same time, validly available or validly obtained is, I think, an important element. And uh, that, to my mind, is something which seems to have balanced concerns across the board. You know, I've spent a long time in the civil service, more than 35 years. Uh, if I ever find any proposition or any policy or any action of anybody in government, which one side loves and another side hates, I know for sure that we've got it wrong, right? I mean, the balance is not right. But if I'm able to find a proposition which either nobody likes too much and nobody dislikes it too much either, then I think you've hit the Goldilocks. You've, you've got the right temperature, you've got it perfectly on because you know everybody can live with it. So that, I think, is what we have managed to do with the Digital Data Protection, uh, 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 Digital Data Privacy Act, because I think we've now been in a position to make sure that it operates in a way with consent, but at the same time rem uh, removes many of the other constraints which can act, and at the same time uh, gives the person who owns the data some recompense, some way of uh, actually obtaining uh, what um, obtaining the sort of redress they can in the system. So to that extent, the privacy issues have been addressed. Beyond that is the security issue, and I think nobody can walk away from it. The biggest concern today, world over, is cybersecurity. Somebody likened what happened with the internet and how it um, how the internet grew, and these issues of cybersecurity, etc., were not given adequate attention. It is true, but I think that was a phase and a time when you wanted the internet to grow. It was an effort to keep it very lightly regulated or not regulated at all so that it could grow. And it has grown today, but it has grown to a size and it has become um, a very essential part of the infrastructure that we use. And so once you reach that stage, I think it's important to start thinking about protecting it and important to start thinking about ways in which we can actually make sure it will continue to work for greater good. And there, we have to start slowly addressing issues of data security. You have to start issuing addresses, uh, addressing issues of cybersecurity. You have to start figuring out who's actually using the system. And, uh, you know, is there a way that you can identify the bad actors when you need to? And undoubtedly, that's an area where, where we cannot lose attention, where uh, continued focus needs to be there. And that's, again, an important and crucial area where at least the government of India believes that it needs to collaborate with a number of agencies across the world, different countries, and not just in the government sector, but also in the private sector. And in the private sector, simply because um, given the nature of the internet, given the nature of various um, applications that the private sector have put out there, their surface of attack is significantly more than practically anything that the private se uh, that the public sector does. And there's a lot to learn from them as well. So I think a collaborative approach to find the right players in the cybersecurity space and to work on it as we go along is something that we cannot at all ignore and undoubtedly is, is a matter of priority to us. Then, of course, comes the whole question of AI and how it overlays uh, uh, what, what can happen with DPI. I think in the course of your panel discussion, you heard a number of people speak about it. You heard a number of people discuss that. One element of it, and I think uh, especially in the Indian context and in the context of many other countries where multiple languages are spoken, where uh, literacy levels and awareness levels are low, 
I think what AI offers, first and foremost, is the opportunity to go voice first instead of having to actually key in stuff, instead of actually having to type stuff. And because it gives us that opportunity to go voice first, enable it to be recognized and translated into multiple voices, multiple languages quickly, it holds a huge opportunity. And that's been our experience in rolling out many of the uh, uh, many of the AI-related applications in this country. I think that is the biggest inclusionary impact that AI could have. And that is the way in which people actually access a DPI could, could completely change when it is voice-based. And that is, that is, I think, a significant step forward. Likewise, in the way that all the data which gets collected and depending on where it resides and the manner in which it would be available for analysis based on a relevant consent could actually lead to wonderful outcomes without compromising on privacy when, when a lot of this data actually gets <clears throat> anonymized and is not available, not personally identifiable. I think that is the other crucial way in which this can actually be supported. And under the India AI mission, which was launched by uh, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, we've taken a very open and uh, uh, um, approach where a very collaborative approach with both industry and academia to bring in more participants and enable a lot of this to happen. Whether it is to build the models, whether it is to collect the data sets, whether it is to um, design applications, whether it is to promote startups in each of these areas. And likewise, also in a way, the way in which the regulation of this entire space needs to be thought of and looked at. In each of these aspects, we've tried to rely on a lot of sourcing and a lot of input from a range of players, range of stakeholders. And that, again, I think is necessarily inclusionary and would enable a lot of this to happen. Likewise, I mean, when you look at uh, the manner in which we have enabled uh, uh, the build out of AI compute, that again is 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 a little different from the way that many others have tried it. We've sort of engaged with the private sector, made sure that they are in a position to contribute to the build out of the AI infrastructure. And that is, that is a way in which we have brought in a variety of players. And where it comes to actual applications for the purpose of uh, greater public good, particularly from the DPI context, I think where uh, India has attempted to do something beyond this is to focus on some areas. I mean, generative AI is a space which can make a significant difference in India, particularly in, in the way that, um, you know, the voice applications I was talking about. But in a country like India, and likewise in many of the countries in the global south, I think the risks of generative AI in terms of, you know, jobs being lost are not as grave as they are in the Western world, where there are a lot more white collar office jobs than they are in our part of the world. What India has as an opportunity and what India can truly offer is the fact that many of the people who may potentially get displaced by generative AI jobs are available to be retrained, to be used to actually ground AI-based applications. Because ultimately, when you look at what needs to happen, there's one part, we develop models, we develop the compute, it's available, and all of this comes in and gets put out in a way that works for people. But these applications ultimately have to be rolled out across the world. They have to be rolled out across India. And if AI is to be really beneficial, uh, in a sense, to the common people, to people to whom it matters, then it really needs to go into the productive sectors of the economy, whether you're talking about industry and particularly, um, you know, small and medium enterprises, whether you're talking about healthcare, whether you're talking about agriculture, it really needs to sort of seep through that and actually work for people in a way that they are able to benefit from it. They are able to see the benefits of productivity going up, uh, better resources being used and so on. And that is truly possible only if uh, uh, we are able to deploy enough trained human resources to enable that to happen. And I think that is India's true trump card uh, in this space. And that is one way in which we can actually enable this to happen for the rest of the world while being aware of each of these, uh, each of these constraints and each of these risks 
And I can I can assure this audience certainly that at least as far as in ensuring that the use of technology, the use of DPIs, the use of AI or any other form of horizontal underlying technology is concerned, our commitment is to necessarily make it inclusionary. And that uh, that stays and that remains. And in every way possible, that's an area that we would continue to work on. Thank you.